Thank you, Chairman and um, Senators. Um, I'm very happy to be here and thank you for the invite. Um, at the county levels, we also consider this a very critical issue and one that we think needs a systemic approach to some coordination and care. Just by way of background of who I am, I've been the Child Welfare Director in Santa Clara County for five years, um, but my career has been as a case caring social worker, supervisor, and manager spanning over 22 years. Um, in fact, I started my career in Los Angeles County, Judge Nash, and spent 10 years um, there before going to Santa Clara County. So. Um, you know, one of the, the things that in child welfare, and a lot has been said about the kids who are being prescribed medication of the trauma that children in the foster care system have experienced, and I'll try not to repeat um, a lot of what has been said, but I can't emphasize enough the fact that the symptoms around those children's trauma cannot just be remediated with medication, that there has to be other therapeutic approaches um, to address that trauma that children have experienced. Um, first of all, the trauma of just their family situation, but then also the trauma associated with being in the foster care system is, is quite significant. Um, the, um, the other thing that I just wanted to emphasize is um, around caregiver support. So when children are placed in out-of-home care, in foster homes, in, in, in group homes, um, there, are typic there, there are oftentimes a lack of support that come to the actual residence the child is in. So I think that that's been said before that we really have to focus on um, individualized services that can be deployed to where a child is, specific to that child's individual needs, um, specific to the level of care that is required. Um, the other thing that's been mentioned is focus on the continuum of care, really the restructuring around um, the placement continuum. And it is true that resources tend to follow higher levels of care. And so oftentimes in dealing with trauma, there may be multiple needs, but children may not meet the level of medical necessity that that justifies or that um, is available to kids who get these really high level of services, like things that we know work, like wraparound, like um, coordinated um, care. And so that's something that um, we need some restructuring in to make these services a lot more available to youth in home-based settings. Um, being attended to by a variety of different players across different spheres of the continuum. Um, we've talked a little bit about the, the process of the authorization for psychotropic medications in the Santa Clara County. Um, we do follow those, those legal mandates around the authorization, and we've also instituted some other safeguards in terms of um, um, case reviews of children who are receiving psychotropic medications. So our behavioral health department does periodic audits, annual audits each year to make sure that clinical protocols are, are, are being followed, that children are receiving medical assessments, but more is needed in the area around coordination. Access across the service delivery continuum um, is sometimes limited um, and not evenly distributed um, to all youth, dependent on their level of care, and so some more focused attention needs to be attended to that. Um, the social workers in the child welfare system are responsible for a multitude of, of different things, and they are, in effect, the, the, the voice to the courts, um, the ones that are bringing information to a variety of different stakeholders to gather, if you will, all the information that's pertinent um, to the people who need to know the information um, to provide the appropriate level of care in partnership with the care providers and other people across the system. That is a lot to manage and more needs to be done to help that system coordination. Um, you know, one of the things that um, we recognize is, you know, as many have said, um, social workers aren't trained to um, be medical professionals, but they are trained to ask questions. And um, more of that needs to be done. I think we really have to, to attend to that. I think social workers do and will question the need for psychotropic medications. Um, in our system, in our county, um, we also do consult with our public health nurses to seek clarification from prescribing um, providers um, around the appropriateness of the use of medications. Um, and, um, but that's not always evenly um, done. 
And so there's, there's real acknowledgement that we need more consistent practice across our continuum to ensure that children are getting the right level of care and all of their needs are being attended to while they are in the child welfare system. <laughs> um, so um, the, the other thing that we really wanted to um, emphasize from our perspective is around the multiple placement issue. Um, that that really exacerbates um, children's stability um, in our services, in our care. It also sometimes will result in children being moved to a variety of different places, failing up into higher levels of care, and also out of county placements, which makes the coordination of care even that much more difficult. Um, so I'm just going to jump in just yeah, for a couple more minutes, and I apologize. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, so, so again, um, focus around the, the coordination of care, regardless of um, what the placement setting is, what jurisdiction the child actually resides in. Access to care shouldn't be dependent upon um, what um, county holds jurisdiction or um, what kind of medical plan that youth has. If they are a child in foster care, they need to have adequate access to all levels of service intervention. And, and particularly focused on trauma-informed systems of care. And so one of the things that um, some of the recommendations that we would have is really around more support for foster care providers, kinship providers, um, so that we can really build our continuum of supports around um, people so that kids can be in family-based settings. We also need to make sure that we focus on our foster care and recruitment effort, and that requires resources. Oftentimes, caregivers um, who can't hang in there for a placement is because they don't feel they have adequate supports to maintain the behaviors that children are exhibiting as a result of their trauma in the home. And because they're seen by professionals um, with, you know, maybe once a month or, you know, once a, a week at most, um, th that becomes really challenging because we hear care providers say, but you're not there when I'm trying to put this child to bed. You're not here to help me when I have to run to the school, you know, several times a week because behaviors aren't being managed. So, um, so additional supports need to be available there. We also need resources just to make across the, the county continuum our whole service delivery system trauma-informed. That means medical providers, that means uh, mental health uh, practitioners, social workers, public health nurses, our entire continuum um, of system. And I'm just going to have to have you wrap up in about 30 seconds. I apologize. No, no, no sure. problem. And so, so, so my last pitch would really Please. be around the data sharing. Um, you know, we know how many kids get authorized, how many are actually taking those medications consistently, how many um, prescriptions have been changed. That is something that is also not evenly tracked. The data is not matched very well. And so we have gaps in the data that um, we would really um, think needs to be shored up. So, and I'll conclude there. Director, thank you so much. And again, I'm not trying to be pushy, so I really apologize um, in really wonderful suggestions as well. And we're so grateful that you're here. What I'd like to better do is uh, turn it over to uh, the senators. And I'll start to my left with uh, Majority Leader Mani. Okay, thank you. Mr. Bell. I had a question for the health experts. Um, uh, one of the issues that we uh, deal with um, with um, our, our children is pregnancy. And I'm concerned about the use of psychotropic drugs with children uh, that get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And can you address that issue and how this fits into the care that we need to provide? What level of care do we need to provide for young women that uh, need a little extra help in terms you know, of that issue? What we've done as public health nurses is we make sure that when we're informed by the child welfare worker that there is a teen that's pregnant, uh, we immediately do a referral to our different home visiting programs that have nurses from the nurse family partnership to a public health nurse um, so that they can follow them from the time of, you know, making sure they get their prenatal care up until sometimes three years after the birth of the child. Mm -hmm. So that is what we've been doing. Actually, within the last two weeks, I've had 
two teens that I've referred and one that has um, had her child three weeks ago. Yeah. So yeah, that, that is definitely something that we try to make those referrals right away and we follow up with the child welfare work to make sure that those linkages, you know, are, are made. In terms of the use of drugs, um, medications, you know, um, that's a very complicated issue. It really is. And, and How what do you deal with that? We, do, you, do you think that deserves a little more attention in the system? or We educate. We, we educate on the pros and the cons. You know, of course, the decision is up to the expectant teen. Um, and I know that um, they talk to their provider about it, you know, their OBGYN mm -hmm. as well. Um, we can't make that decision for them, but we definitely make sure that they're well educated and they can make that the best decision for them on their own. Yeah, I like to point out that that's a you know obvious risk that we have to deal with, um, protecting not only the mother but the child. But the unborn, absolutely. So you know, we we found that um, I'd say about sixty percent that I've worked with decide to forego the medications during the pregnancy. We look at some non-farm things that they can do to manage their symptoms and, you know, their behaviors, and they wait until after they stop breastfeeding before they take them again. So success is really good. I would say 70% of the cases that I've worked with. And that's, and that's um, in terms of taking um, uh, psychotropic uh, Yes, absolutely, drugs. yes. So they yes. still take the drugs while they're pregnant, or seventy percent choose not to. Seventy choose not mm -hmm. to. That's good. Mm -hmm. And they do very well. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I just want to add one thing to that. It, it's very important that, as you mentioned, that the OBGYN coordinates with the individual that is prescribing the psychotropic medication. And often it's the case that the OBGYN services are available through the Medi-Cal managed care plan and the mental health services yeah. are delivered through the mental health plan and those there are barriers there for those two systems communicating. Thank you. We have to work on that. So, do you have any comments on that? Uh, my friend <laughs> from <laughs> Santa Clara County. I worked with her <laughs> Santa Clara County for quite a bit. Yeah, so, no. Okay. Well, thank you very much. No, thank you so much, Senator. I just had one question and this is for uh, Mr. Grimm. Um, in if you can just go into what we know about the number of foster kids that receive um, baseline screenings prior to being de uh, prescribed, would love to go to get your take on that, and then um, as well as ongoing follow-up screenings. And we're going to have you talk into the mic, and I apologize. Sure. Okay. Uh, particularly for the antipsychotics, a certain baseline lab screenings have been recommended by the American Diabetes Association and the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, the compliance with having those screenings done is somewhere in the area of 10 to 15 percent. So 85 percent of children don't have those monitoring labs completed before they begin on antipsychotics. Uh, not long ago, the American, or rather the Canadian Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry uh, issued a very strong statement, basically said if a physician does not assure that these initial baseline screenings are obtained for children being prescribed antipsychotics, the physician shouldn't be writing the prescription. Uh, yet that happens in t way too many cases. Uh, recently, the HEDIS, the organization that sits, sort of sets national standards for healthcare programs, not just uh, Medicaid, but also for commercial programs, has adopted a standard that requires baseline screenings for children who are being administered antipsychotics. So we definitely need to uh, improve uh, the medical practice and the screenings. I think the follow-up is probably just as bad, although we don't have the same kind of data, I think, on the follow-up as we do have on the initial screenings and the lack thereof. Pretty staggering statistic of 85 percent. That's significant. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that uh, one particular question? We'll look to the uh, senators if there are any further questions or comments for this Thank panel. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank our panel. Thank you so much. Thank you.
We're now going to be bringing up our final panel of the day, and that is innovative models in the continuum of care. And I know that the senators and I are looking forward to also hearing from all of you as well that may have questions or comments. Uh, this final panel is going to highlight the type of services that we might consider in developing a continuum of services that really truly meets the needs of foster youth and prevents the need for medication. Um, I think I could speak for the senators that this is going to be one of the most important conversations that the state needs to have in tracking this problem. Uh, here is where uh, we're going to try to answer the question, what is the non-pharmacological system of care that we're going to have to build around kids who've experienced trauma? Uh, and we have a wonderful panel here today. Uh, would like to be able to introduce all the way from Humboldt County, uh, Rochelle Trachenberg. Uh, Rochelle has just been outspoken, and we're very grateful uh, that she is here and also a, a former foster youth as well. And we're grateful that you would travel so far to be here with you today, and good to see you. Uh, we have Tony DeMarco, who's Clinical Services Manager for Behavioral Health and Recovery Services uh, from San Mateo County Mental Health. We're grateful that uh, Sarah Potter is uh, here today, the Executive Partner of Family and Youth Roundtable from San Diego. Uh, Ken Barrick is the Executive Director for Seneca Family of Agencies, and we're grateful that you're here. Uh, from the beautiful county of Sonoma, we have Amber Twitchell, uh, who is the Initiative Director of Voices, and then we also have Jabari West, a member of California Youth Connection, and uh, we're grateful uh, that, Jabari, that you're here as well, and good to see you. Um, we're going to kick it off today with Sarah Potter, uh, and again, Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. I feel very honored and privileged to be here today to discuss this important issue. Our panel felt it was critical to open and close with the stories and perspectives of alumni of CARE. Like many foster youth, I entered CARE at 18 months old due to my parents' drug abuse, which led to domestic violence and then neglect. I remained in CARE until finally emancipating at 18 years old. As you can imagine, I have many different stories that I could share with you about growing up in foster care, but I'd like to tell you what I experienced when I was 16. In 2006, I was a junior in high school, an honors student with the coveted position as the editor of my high school's newspaper. In addition to the college trajectory I was on, my mother had recently found stable employment and housing, and the decision to reunify us was made. I packed my bags for what I thought was the last time to live with the mother I hadn't been with in over 15 years. No less than one week after moving in, she informed my caseworker that she had changed her mind, and I was thrust right back into care. I went through four different schools in a two-week span following that decision, only, end up, only to end up back in the high school where I had enthusiastically declared to my peers and teachers that I was finally going to live with the mother I had been waiting for my entire life. With no additional support to help navigate my natural grieving process, I started to vocalize my feelings about being abandoned and rejected all over again. I was referred to an adult psychiatrist in an outpatient facility. At the first appointment, I sat in a lobby full of severely mentally ill adults feeling insecure and scared. When it was finally my turn to see the doctor, I don't think an entire 15 minutes passed before I was handed a prescription for a psychotropic medication and told to return in six weeks. What I wasn't told was that the medication can increase my sadness and also cause suicidal thoughts and feelings. And when the drugs didn't work and my feelings intensified as a side effect of the medications, my diagnoses changed. What started as natural sadness and grief became major depressive disorder because I was experiencing more sadness and now suicidal thoughts. And when my symptoms weren't alleviated within six weeks on an antidepressant, suddenly I had bipolar disorder. And when that medication didn't work and I began to express my frustration and concern that the drugs were causing more harm than good, my diagnosis became oppositional defiance disorder. In only 24 weeks, I had been saddled with three different diagnoses and three different sets of stereotypes that would continue to haunt me well into my adult life. During the worst of it, I could no longer stay awake in class. I was fired from the school newspaper and placed in a continuation school for students who were credit deficient. I went from studying for the SATs to being unable to form a coherent sentence. I made the decision to get off the medication and as quickly as possible. In a moment of desperation, I stopped taking them altogether and wound up in the hospital with very serious and dangerous withdrawals. 
Fortunately, with some persuasion, the doctors at the hospital and my caregiver agreed to help me taper safely off the medication on the condition that I participated in healthy alternatives. Mentors and teachers stepped in to help me regain control of my life. I began speaking with a high school counselor on a regular basis and even joined a dance team. I was able to tour colleges and begin the application process, which was an important endeavor considering my impending emancip emancipation. And most importantly, I was given the time to grieve following the rejection by my mother. Today, I can proudly stand here and I can say that I'm a graduate of San Diego State University with a, a bachelor's in social work, and I received my master's in public policy and administration from Northwestern University. And while my story isn't as bad as others, it's all too common. Medication is often the first line of defense, not the last resort. As a system, we fail to adequately explore non-pharmacological alternatives. And when medications are prescribed, it is often done so in inappropriate settings like group homes by doctors who lack knowledge <coughs> on this unique experiences and needs of youth in foster care. I often get asked what I think the correct solution is and while there is no one answer, today I would like to challenge us to change the conversation. We keep discussing how we can improve the use of psychotropics and reduce over-reliance, but what we aren't talking about is how we can promote the long-term health and well-being of children and youth in foster care. We must think beyond data collection and monitoring and develop a shared goal that ensures youth are healthy, safe, and thriving upon leaving care and entering adulthood. Thank you. So thank you so much and a true inspiration and thank congratulations, you. my goodness. Thank you very much. Hey. We're really glad you're here with us today. Uh, we would now like to be able to turn it over to Rochelle Trotzenberg, uh, who is a youth organizer with Humboldt County Transition Age Youth Collaboration. Rochelle, again, thank you for making uh, the trek down, and we're grateful that you're here. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Rochelle Trottenberg, and I am the lead youth organizer for HCTC, or the Humboldt County Transition Age Youth Collaboration. And I'm a former foster youth that experienced the unfortunate side effects of too many medications that I was on for way too long and that were prescribed without other psychosocial interventions and without my voice being included in the process or being able to give consent. While I was on medication, I experienced many adverse side effects, including weight gain, lethargy, and tardive dyskinesia, as well as tremors that still haven't gone away today. However, it was not until years after leaving foster care that other aspects of healing and mental wellness were provided. Medications are not the silver bullet. They're not a long-term solution, and they should not be provided without a broader array of services. I hope that we can work together to transform this system and support the funding of preventative models that keep children from needing costly and powerful psychotropic medications. I'm going to ask you to put yourself in my shoes, in the shoes of foster youth, for just a minute. We've been removed from our parents due to abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, violence. Now we're living with strangers. We're in a new school, we're in a new neighborhood. Perhaps we've switched schools and homes several times within short periods of time. This is the life of a child in foster care. We feel lost, alone, sad, and are trying to make sense of chaos all around us, which we have little to no control over. Medications alone aren't the answer, and again, should only be used as a last resort and in conjunction with other prevention and intervention efforts, as well as monitoring and oversight. So I just talked about what it may be like to walk in our shoes, but this applies to your life as well. I want to stop and ask you to think about a time in your life when you went through a major transition or a major loss. What did you do to take care of yourself during those times? What would you do to help take care of your children during those times? The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have identified five social determinants of mental health. Safe housing, safe neighborhoods, equitable jobs and wages, quality education, and access to quality health care. When a foster youth has access to these five things, it has the potential to enhance their emotional, psychological, and social well-being, and the ability to be resilient in overcoming the trauma and loss that so many of us foster youth have been suffering from. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration defines wellness not as the absence of disease or illness or stress, but the presence of purpose in life, active involvement in satisfying work and play, joyful relationships, a healthy body and living environment, and happiness. 
So what does this mean for children in foster care? We should be asking, are youth getting a quality education? Are youth living in safe environments that reduce stress and re-traumatization? Re are children getting to participate in spiritual and cultural activities? Do they have strong bonds and connections to loving and supportive adults? Are youth getting access to nutritious food and given the opportunities to exercise and play? If we're answering no to any of these questions, perhaps medication should not be our answer. It means that we should require that children in foster care get to participate in age and developmentally appropriate extracurricular enrichment, cultural, and social activities. The best prevention efforts can dramatically improve the overall mental wellness of children in foster care. Again, the World Health Organization has defined mental health as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes their own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to their community. Psychotropic and medications alone will not help foster youth actualize this definition. Instead, we need to put our efforts into promoting prevention models that prioritize and enhance those social determinants of mental health I just spoke about. The Humboldt County Transition Age Youth Collaboration is one such intervention. We're all about youth voice and engagement. We work with youth ages 16 to 26 who have lived experience with foster care, mental health, juvenile justice, and homelessness. We work together to improve systems and services that support the positive development of young people. We believe that healing can come through the participation and advocacy opportunities. We help youth develop those skills and the leadership so that they can effectively advocate for their rights and their voice within the system and other systems that serve them for the purpose of empowering youth to be equal partners in the process of change. We believe that by having youth involved at every level of decision making, that systems will be better able to operate effective, responsive, and youth-informed systems of care. Youth-centered programs and practices are a best practice and will yield better outcomes. When we let youth lead us, they can guide us to the path of wellness. I want to thank you for taking the time to address this important issue. You have the opportunity this year to be a legislator that champions transformations in children's mental health and child welfare. Over the next several months, you will hear the opinions from a lot of people on this topic. But I ask you to remember that those are paid voices and that the only voice that speaks from the heart is the foster youth's voice. So I urge you to remember our voice and let it resonate with you in all your decision making. I ask you to stand strong and to remember the voices of foster youth you hear today and to leave a legacy of a legislature that did the right thing for foster children. Thank you. Sure, you did a great job. Absolutely, please. <laughs> did a great job uh, and spoke from the heart. So very grateful. I know all of us are. Thank you so much. My goodness. Uh, I would now like to be able to introduce Tony DeMarco. Uh, she is the Clinical Services Manager for Behavioral Health and Recovery from San Mateo Can County Mental Health, and we're grateful that you're here today and spending so much time with us, and welcome. 